Uh, good morning and welcome to the Mary Thornton Sunday School class here on June the 28th. Uh, we are continuing to be under unusual circumstances, not only uh, with what's going on in the world at large, but what's going on at First Presbyterian Church here in Kosciuszko. Uh, we're gathering under strange circumstances. Uh, we have begun to uh, resume our Sunday morning worship services under precautions, maskings, and spacings, and uh, protections that are recommended to us by the medical community. Uh, we've had to adjust our lives as uh, citizens and as uh, uh, just people who are living in this particular time. Uh, so these are unusual times. The elders and the deacons have have under discussion how to, uh, it's, it's called reopen, reopening for the most part, or regathering, uh, and I would encourage you to take advantage of the communication resources that come from the church to you about that. Uh, I would imagine that by the middle of July, we'll be having more than just uh, Sunday morning worship services, but uh, stay tuned and uh, stay in touch. Uh, with the church. Uh, this morning we're going to continue our study in Genesis. We're going to continue our study in God's family. We're going to continue our study in Jacob and his family today. We've seen how God identifies a people for himself. We see that how people come to him by faith. We see the grace of God exhibited in his dealings with his family, his people the people of his choosing, and we continue that this morning. When we left last time we were together, by this means uh, we did discuss Jacob's wrestling uh, with a man, with an angel, with a divine being. Uh, I think this is sometime later as we pick up the narrative in Genesis uh, chapter 39, uh, and we uh, see the story of this uh, unusual family, uh, this uh, family of origins, uh, this family that uh, uh, is dysfunctional in many regards. And uh, one of the conclusions we can draw from that is that, uh, that no family and no individual comes to God in their own merits. Uh, we come to God uh, by grace through faith. We come to God in the merit of Christ alone. Uh, and uh, so we, we take the, uh, the bizarre nature and patterns of uh, biblical characters uh, and we understand them in light of God's grace poured out upon them and as they are poured out upon us. Uh, so we've looked at Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and their families and God's grace extended to them. Uh, we're going to talk today about uh, uh, Jacob's favorite son, uh, Joseph, and uh, God's providence in his life, the way in which God has orchestrated his life for the benefit of his people. And we can also, I think, in a very, uh, I'm terribly convinced about this, that uh, God shows us in the like of life of Joseph and in his providential uh, work in Joseph's life, how he works in our own lives as well and orchestrates them. Uh, before we get uh, started with the lesson, let me uh, open with prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for the beauty of this morning. We thank you for the season of heat and humidity. We thank you for the, uh, uh, this day, uh, this day of worship, this day that the Lord has made. May we rejoice in it. As we are in unusual circumstances, O oh Lord, we ask that we will rejoice in that as well. May we see uh, these uncertain and changing times as uh, a part of your part of the page of history that you wrote before the world was. Uh, and may our confidence be in your sovereignty and in your grace in our lives and as we see it in the lives that have, those that have gone before us and those that come after us. Uh, we ask that you will shine the light of your gospel upon us and our children and our children's children 
and all the generations to come as you have in the past. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, Dr. Scott has framed uh, this lesson, the 10th lesson in our quarterly study here, as the purging of Jacob's family. And so I guess it would be appropriate for us to, uh, and I, I want to uh, spend a minute to talk about uh, what uh, purging means. Uh, I think uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, mentions of that particular word uh, we can find in Psalm 51, as David prays that prayer of confession and repentance before God, when he says, purge me with hyssop. Uh, so I think we can look at purging as a cleansing. Uh, we looked in previous lessons about God's discipline upon his people, his training of them. Uh, but I think, uh, I believe that uh, in uh, focusing upon what it means to purge, we look uh, uh, simply look at things that should not be in us that are removed from us. Uh, not to be crass or uh, uh, un unbecoming, but, a, but I have a I have a friend. Uh, the, my cameraman this morning is a Louisianan, and before they serve you crawfish, they'll purge them. And I'll not get into the detail of what that means, but they they remove things that you might not want uh, in your crawfish from them, uh, a contamination, so to speak. Uh, we, uh, in political science, you read about purgings of governments. A lot of times when, uh, in, in history, when uh, royal families changed, they would purge the household of the previous royalty to eliminate any, uh, uh, any rivals uh, from them. Uh, and we see today with much emphasis upon uh, uh, human health and so forth, uh, I think in some uh, dietary regimens, it is recommended that from time to time we purge ourselves to cleanse our bodies of, of things uh, uh, in them that, uh, that are unhealthy for them to be there. Uh, so a, uh, an eight, uh, 19th century dictionary definition of to purge is as follows, to cleanse or purify by separating and carrying off whatever is impure foreign or superfluous, to clear from guilt or moral defilement, to purge away sin. So here Scott wants us to focus upon the events in the life of Jacob's family and in the life of Joseph and his brothers at the circumstances that God uses to remove from them uh, some of uh, the residual sin that resides within them to to uh, enhance their character, uh, to encourage their trust in Him, and to uh, uh, and to use them as a people for Himself, glorifying to Himself. Uh, so uh, we'll we'll use that word uh, from time to time. I'm sure. Again. Well, uh, our lesson today is from Genesis chapter 39 through Genesis 44, uh, a lengthy scriptural lesson. Uh, but before we get into that lesson and, and some of those passages of scripture, uh, let me just go over with you the cast of characters that we will see uh, in our lesson today. This is not uh, all inclusive, but I think these are the major characters in this uh, in this part of the story. Of course, we have Jacob, the patriarch of the family, as we are looking at it. Uh, Joseph, the favorite son who was sold into slavery. Judah, one of the uh, uh, one of the sons and Simeon and Reuben. And then uh, an Egyptian character, uh, Potiphar, uh, who was part of the uh, governmental structure of Pharaoh and Potiphar's wife, and a cupbearer to, to Pharaoh, and a baker in the kitchen of Pharaoh, uh, and Pharaoh himself. So th that's not an exhaustive list, list of characters, but these are people that we encounter in, in the unfolding of this story that we'll be looking at. Uh, what Dr. Scott wants us to do in his, uh, in his writing of this lesson is to focus upon the purging of Joseph uh, and the purging of Jacob uh, 
and the purging of uh, Judah uh, by uh, and working that among the uh, among the narrative of these chapter, chapters of Scripture. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, to to elaborate on the on the process, I guess, of of this purging, uh, we are commended to look at how. Uh, in order to rid us of the residual sin that resides within us, one of the things that has to be dealt with is our pride, and our pride is often dealt with through humiliation to arrive at the place of humility. And so we see that as one of the means by which God purges me, purges us, and purges uh, the, the, uh, some of the characters in this story here. Uh, Jacob, Joseph, and Judah, to be uh, to be precise, uh, and so uh, we'll see that uh, humiliation and humility uh, is the object of God's purging of us. Another thing that we might see as an uh, as the product of a purge uh, of of, uh, of the old nature in us is to teach us patience. Uh, and so we see that, uh, that that is patience is enforced upon some of the characters in this story here. Another uh, attribute that uh, uh, comes forth, can, can and should come forth from uh, the purging of God's people is that they are compassionate. They think of others more than themselves. Uh, Self-service is, is natural to us. Selfishness is natural to us. Uh, being in control is natural to us. Uh, but we see so often Christ is introduced to us in his interaction with people as having compassion upon them. So uh, were we to uh, aspire to have the attributes of Christ, we would be compassionate people. Uh, and we also see in these narratives commitments uh, and uh, wholehearted commitments. Uh, something I read recently was that that partial obedience is disobedience. And so God wants us to be committed to him without equivocation. Uh, he wants uh, an unequivocal loyalty to him. And so uh, we see uh, we see in the story, uh, you might keep an ear out or as if you read along or have read, uh, this portion of Genesis, uh, keep an eye out for these uh, results of God's purging of his people. Well, I think, uh, I, think, uh, I think this is reasonably accurate information. I'm certainly not infallible nor inerrant, uh, but I think Joseph was about 17 years old when he was sold into slavery. Uh, a lot of talk about slavery uh, these days in, uh, in the news. Uh, but Joseph was sold as a chattel. Uh, in lieu of being murdered by his brothers, they sold him off into slavery. And so we pick up today's story that Joseph is a slave, 17-year-old boy in a foreign country, in a foreign place, in the unusual circumstances. Uh, and uh, but we see in the narrative, I'll uh, we'll go to the scriptures and read. We're not going to read five chapters of Genesis, but we will look at certain portions of it, uh, beginning in chapter thirty-nine. Uh, this is God's word. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him an overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Uh, so uh, 
uh, that, that's a that's a pretty full passage right there. But but we see, you know, what happened to Joseph? Well, he was sold into slavery. Well, then he was bought, uh, bought by a man of some standing. Uh, and it's interesting uh, that it uh, the scriptures articulate uh, that he was uh, that he was an Egyptian, uh, that he was captain of the guard, and. Uh, and a man of some uh, some standing there, and so Joseph is his is his slave. Uh, one of the questions I ask myself as we get into the story is how how did what was the pedagogy? What was the means by which Joseph was educated enough uh, to have the strength of character that he had uh, in the in the story that we're about to look at? Uh, and so my, my personal conclusion is that that as we uh, as we have through the years in this class talked about uh, where was the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, uh, and uh, as opposed to Pentecost and and in our day to day. So not not to get too deep into that subject, but the conclusion that I have drawn with regard to uh, how to understand the narrative of today's lesson is that the Holy Spirit was in Joseph. Uh, now, his, his mom and daddy might have taught him some good stuff, uh, but his daddy wasn't exactly the, uh, uh, he wasn't the uh, chairman of the board of the local seminary. Uh, he, had, uh, he had a lot of baggage in his own life and much to learn from the Lord. He was a, he was a scoundrel saved by grace through faith, just as we are. Uh, but nevertheless, here's a 17-year-old boy he is in the circumstances that have been described in the early verses of chapter 39, and the Lord, Lord's hand was upon him. The Lord blessed him. It doesn't say that because Joseph was such a great and pure young man, but I, to me, the only way that Joseph could have done what he did is the Lord's hand was upon him. It came from outside of him, as, as well as uh, perhaps some background of teaching that he understood. But he was a God-fearer. He knew God, and, uh, and he had relationship with God. And any time that happens, God has initiated something in, in that person. And so I would say here, as we see that the Lord was with Joseph, well, how would the Lord be with Joseph in the Old Testament? Jesus wasn't there and so forth. So I would say the Lord was with Joseph in the, in the person of the Holy Spirit and blessed him. And so Joseph was successful. And not only we see that God promised Abraham that, that he would bless him, but that the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. Well, here we may see that in microcosm here is that God blessed Joseph under these circumstances and he blessed the household of Potiphar because Joseph was there. Not because Potiphar was a great guy, but because God's blessings were upon Joseph and he blessed other people through uh, his people or his person or his boy, Joseph, in the house of Potiphar. Uh, so I think there's, there is, uh, I think that is an interesting uh, thought uh, in this passage here. Uh, so uh, Potiphar saw that the Lord was with Joseph and the Lord blessed his master, blessed Potiphar and his household and everything that Joseph did. Uh, but here we see a test of, of Joseph. You might say that Joseph had sort of, uh, uh, he'd, landed, uh, he'd landed on his feet after his brothers had sold him off into slavery. But I think this next episode is is uh, is remarkable in in several aspects, uh, but uh, the the scriptures say that Joseph was handsome. This is uh, uh, down in verse. Uh, if I can get my uh, in verse eight, uh, six, seven, and eight. Uh, and now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes, eyes upon Joseph and said, lie with me. Well, all right, so here we have uh, this uh, young man, this boy, uh, probably at the height of his, uh, uh, of his juices flowing as things go, if we look at uh, the way uh, young boys are right now. But he was, he was uh, uh, a young man of integrity. But here, the, the wife of his 
owner, the wife of his boss, the head of the household's wife, begins, uh, uh, makes a proposition to Joseph uh, to, uh, to lie with her. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that's enough said there, uh, but I think in the narrative we see that it's even more uh, ominous than that. Because it says uh, that day after day, uh, she kept asking him to lie with her. Uh, and so uh, this is something, this temptation, this inducement, uh, this assault upon Joseph was day after day. It was persistent, and yet he resisted. Uh, uh, he refused. Uh, she cast her eyes upon Joseph and to lie with me, but he refused and said to his master's wife. So this is this is the response of a young man uh, to a, uh, a solicitation by his uh, his master's wife. Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in the house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or with her. And so here we see, I think, a very powerful and dramatic statement of God's having his hand upon Joseph, Joseph being a young man of character uh, to an extraordinary degree here, and how he was uh, uh, presented with a persistent uh, assault by this, by this woman. And yet, what was his rationale? How could he do it? Well, first of all, he recognized sin when he saw it. This is a great wickedness. Uh, and he knew it was wrong, and he was thankful and mindful of the position that Potiphar had entrusted to him. And then he said, how can I sin against God? Uh, a, a, a marvelous and, and profound profession of faith and commitment to the Lord here. And so Joseph uh, resisted and did not relent. The temptation was overt, it was strong, it was persistent. Uh, but uh, but it, he had an uncompromising commitment to God's honor and did not uh, succumb. Uh, and so uh, you probably recall the story is that uh, uh, nobody was in the house. She uh, uh, approached him again. And he fled, and she uh, and he left his coat behind, or his cloak behind. Part of his garments were left behind as he fled from her presence. Nobody else was in the house. She screamed, and so her story to the servants that came when she screamed, and to her husband was that he uh, he attempted to assault me, and uh, and left his garment behind. As a result thereof. As a result of doing the right thing, Joseph finds himself in prison uh, unjustly. Uh, uh, a lot of talk about uh, justice and mercy and and uh, and things like that uh, in today, and rightfully so. Uh, and I might uh, uh, this this is a recommendation uh, if you're interested in reading about. Uh, part of our modern culture here today. I should have more information. I should have the gentleman's name who wrote the book, but uh, uh, there's a book you might be interested in reading. Uh, uh, the title of the book is Just Mercy. It's about a young man from Delaware, went to Harvard Law School, and uh, invested himself in, in defending and reopening death row cases uh, all over the country. The story uh, that's narrated in that book, Just Mercy, is about uh, some cases down in the state of Alabama. But but clearly the uh, uh, the man on death row that's in that book was not guilty. But uh, uh, and there are instances of that. You may know of many personally or read about them or so forth. But this certainly is a case we can see from soup to nuts here that Joseph 
uh, was treated unjustly as he was in prison. It's interesting that his master didn't kill him, uh, but again, his master wasn't in charge of what was going on here. God was uh, narrating that story here. So uh, Joseph is in prison and he encounters uh, two uh, people, uh, a cupbearer to, to Pharaoh and a baker in the kitchen of Pharaoh. And uh, he was, uh, they were his fellow prisoners. Joseph found favor also with the warden. We would say the warden of the prison. And maybe he had privileges, probably did. Uh, how else could favor be shown? Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the cupbearer and the uh, baker had dreams that Joseph interpreted for them, giving the glory there to God uh, again. And, uh, and those two, two men were uh, released from prison. And one of the dreams uh, was interpreted as you will be reinstated to the position which you held. That's the cupbearer. And the baker was told that you'll be uh, out of prison for three days and then you're going to be hung. And that happened as well. But uh, I guess the poignant start of part of the story is that uh, when the cupbearer was released, uh, uh, Joseph said, Rem this is in verse 14 of chapter 40, only remember me when it is well with you and please do, not, uh, do me the kindness to remember me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house, get me out of this place. And so Joseph asked the cupbearer, remember me uh, and tell Pharaoh about me. Uh, but for two years, the cupbearer did not remember Joseph. Again, that's, uh, uh, th this is part of that patience we talked about here. Uh, but God, in God's providence, it wasn't a time. The time wasn't right. Uh, but nevertheless, after two years, then Pharaoh has a dream. And Joseph interprets that dream. And I'm, uh, I'm picking up the pace here a little bit. But Pharaoh's dream had to do with uh, seven fat cows, seven fat uh, ears of corn or wheat, and seven lean cows and seven lean uh, ears of corn. And the interpretation of those dreams, as you might recall, is that Egypt was going to have seven years of plenty, and then there would be seven years of famine. And so this was a, uh, uh, a providential heads up uh, to, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know that God was, uh, or I would say that, that God was not doing an extraordinary kindness to Pharaoh because of Pharaoh, but God was providing for his people in this unusual way by giving Pharaoh <coughs> a heads up of what to expect. And so uh, that was, none of Pharaoh's uh, advisors could come up with the answer to the riddle, but Joseph uh, again, attributes his capacity to interpret dreams uh, to God and gives the honor to God. And so as a result of that, uh, Joseph is now promoted to, uh, uh, to second in command over the whole uh, uh, nation of Egypt. And here I am at the end of, uh, at the end of time, and we've just gotten Joseph Back, back out of prison and uh, and back in a good situation and hadn't gotten to the heart of this story about the purging of Jacob's uh, family. But uh, the next time we're together, we can pick up with this. Uh, but uh, let uh, let me review just a little bit. Uh, one uh, to remind you that God pur purges us uh, by his by his providential. Uh, actions uh, brings us to places where he can speak to us and we will listen and uh, brings us to places where we recognize that there are attitudes, attributes, and patterns in our lives that are displeasing to him and uses the adversity of circumstance to bring us to our knees before him. And uh, I would say it's not a uh, it's not a heavy-handed exercise of punishment, but it is a gracious exercise of mercy upon us that God condescends to show us ourselves as we are, that we may be relieved of the burdens of our sin, but also uh, 
that we may take delight in his grace extended to us. And so I think we see that in the life uh, of Joseph. And uh, uh, we'll, get, we'll get to this later as, he and, as his family is reunited and so forth. Uh, but here, uh, I would say this is one of the uh, one of the several. I don't know how many they are, but this is one of the most powerful uh, presentations of how God works for good, uh, works together for good, and uh, uses even sinful vessels to accomplish His purposes. And as Joseph will tell his brothers uh, in, in his interaction with them, that you intended this for evil, but God intended it for good. So God worked ultimate good out of the, uh, out of the adversities and difficulties and sinful actions of his family, people that he had chosen for himself. Uh, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll draw, draw our thoughts uh, prematurely to a close. Uh, let's pray. Uh, oh God, we are thankful that you do not uh, hold us uh, before yourself clothed in our sins, uh, but you accept us before yourself clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Uh, may we not uh, seek to avoid purgings to be separated from those things in us that are displeasing to you. Uh, but may we understand our disappointments and our adversities and our humiliations as being means by which uh, you bring blessing to us. Uh, we thank you for this great story of your blessing and your favor being upon Joseph. And we dare to ask you for your blessing and your favor upon us but we don't do it because we are so good, but because we trust in your goodness. And as a result, may, may our character of following you be developed, and it cannot be developed without exercise and without adversity and without trials and without your demonstration of faithfulness to us through that. So we don't, ask, we don't ask for troubles, but we ask when troubles and trials come that we may uh, see you as faithful as you are. In Jesus' name, amen.